Welcome back to The Real Story with Jeannie Ives. It is my honor and pleasure to have Jim Urio on with me right now. He spent 30 plus years brokering futures and option trades for large institutional clients. He's a 1987 graduate of the University of Illinois with a BA in economics. Hey, that's the same year I graduated from West Point with a BS in economics. So we have that in common after that, not much. (laughs) He is the host of the Futures Edge podcast where he discusses commodities, crypto, FX futures, and some politics. The only thing I understand out of that list is some politics. So I really appreciate his insight, but I cannot, it's really hard to follow his conversation. So we're going to be talking today about things that normal people can understand and not the futures market at all. Um, He's also, more importantly, the owner of the restaurant Brant's in Palatine. And let's just start there, Jim, because I got to tell you, I looked at it, the NFIB, National Federation of Independent Businesses, they just recently raided the Illinois legislators and every single Democrat has a failing grade when it comes to voting for small businesses. And in many cases, 46 out of 78 of those in the Illinois House literally voted against small business every opportunity that a vote came up, every single time they voted against small business. I mean, how do you, what do you think of this? First of all, I think just saying it's a failing grade is actually softening the blow a little bit. I mean, those people are terrible. And I understand, like, what has happened over the decades is that this notion that got in their heads that there was this massive division between the business owners and labor. There's not. Most well-run small businesses, the, the labor is very much in tune with the owners in trying to make the business successful. They don't believe that. They somehow think that we're banking away all this dough and we have wheelbarrows full of cash that we're taking out. It's absolutely absurd. You mentioned some of the different policies they've gone after, like not just minimum wage. And minimum wage is is the level of it is that it is now, 12 to $13 and continue to go up, is absolutely asinine for small businesses. So many small businesses, particularly restaurants, like to hire local high school kids as part of almost a community outreach program to teach them job skills. They are not worth 13 or 14 bucks an hour, they, and they won't be anytime soon. It is, it is a, you know, a symbiotic thing between the employer and the employee to, within the community. But anyway, so it, the notion that they are against small business is me has gone from a notion to gone fact. Carol Roth, uh, I'm sure you know she is. She wrote the book, The War on Small Business. And it has to be that government feels they can control big business chains a lot easier than they can control mom and pop restaurants. Now, to, to underscore another thing too is the the um, and business loans for small for uh, family-owned restaurants, delinquencies are the highest rate they've ever been right now. And I don't see how more aren't folding already considering that costs have gone up by over 50% in two and a half years time. And we have Springfield just with us in the crosshairs. You know, I used to be the minority spokesperson on the labor, not commerce committee, which is what I called it. And uh, literally the, the mentality down there from the other side was that we know how to run your business better than you do. There's nothing in your business that we can't regulate. And employers are always bad actors against their employees. That was that was how they approached every single bill that came up. And the notion is absolutely asinine. And the funniest part about it, when you break it down to a local level, like the town of Palatine, the town of Palatine is great with our businesses. Our mayor, Jim Schwantz, is wonderful. He's always like, what do you need for us to make you better? And then you get to the county and the state. I don't think they would give one crap. I'm sorry about the language on your show. If they put every business out of business, every small business, and then they'd wonder like where their revenue went. I don't think they're sophisticated or smart enough to understand that's what fuels you know, the the tax revenue for the state. Well, I mean, a big business, obviously, also, which they kowtow to them like you wouldn't believe. Well, so, I mean, you know, speaking of businesses, I mean, taxation is one of the biggest issues, certainly, whether it's employee taxes, UI taxes, unemployment insurance taxes, $5 billion in fraud at the Illinois state level. And the the Pritzker's response was, well, we're going to tax the businesses more. We're not going to go after the fraudsters and recoup that money. We're going to tax businesses more. But taxes have an effect. And now you look at Kamala Harris's tax plan and you've got to say, Literally, you're going to get rid of the most prosperous um, increase in uh, federal taxes that came in after the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act. And you're just going to trash it all and then add on an unrealized gains tax. Are you crazy? 
<laughs> so here's the thing that I've been writing about recently. So there's five different economic policies that she's recently unveiled just in the last two weeks. Taxing unrealized tech, uh, capital gains, which is asinine. And they're not talking about uh, taxing unrealized capital losses. And just before I move on to the other ones, I will say this. When Jeff Bezos has to sell 2.5% of his stock to, <laughs> to, uh, to meet his tax burden, as a trader, it would be irresponsible of me not to front run the heck out of that order and try to take advantage of it. So selling begets selling, and that would act and we absolutely market destabilizing. So let's move along. Price gouging from rest from uh, grocery stores. I don't even think I have to even mention that because it's so ridiculous. Uh, 44% capital gains. The Democrats have admitted publicly that they know full well that raising that tax re- results in less revenue from that tax because it discourages actual transactions. And rich people can find ways to avoid it and to Get money out of their accounts without taking a tax without taking a tax uh, event. Uh, corporate taxes of twenty eight percent. I mean, are you serious? Th- this is literally they're acting like they're taxing the corporations. This is the same thing at a federal level that we're talking about in the Illinois level, where they're acting like these businesses are so, they're getting away with something, and we're going to get them back for labor. And the the fact that people are unsophisticated enough to vote for it is beyond me. Now, the most important part of all these things is that. They know that they're toxic and awful. Every one of their economists knows that they're toxic and awful. Jason Furman, one of Obama's top economists, just came out and he broke with the party line on the left saying, yeah, no, these are these are bad things. This is not the way to build an economy. So they know it as well, too. It's just populist nonsense. And some people will say, oh, they don't attend. They, they can never get them passed. So it's not that big a deal. That's an asinine thing to say as well, too, because what they're really trying to do then is so division and make the, the unsophisticated voter of theirs be like grab their pitchforks and want to go after the elites. And this is just it, it's being mischaracterized and it's absurd. Well, and also the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act absolutely simplified things for most families, let's face it. And the, the problem is, is that the politicians aren't sophisticated enough. They don't have the tax background to actually understand this. Now, I did taxes on a very small level for eight years of, you know, at H&R Block, by the way, which I had great training because I was the pencil and paper people. We had to move everything over. So we really had to understand all how all everything worked together. But the biggest thing that they did with the Tax Cut and Jobs Act is that when they got rid of the SALT deduction, which nobody understands, and especially in Illinois, they do not understand this. When they got rid of that, they also got rid of AMT, alternative minimum tax. And so many people who were saying that, oh, you know, I got my SALT deduction, my state and local tax deduction reduced to just a, a 10,000, don't realize that they also didn't get hit with AMT. I mean, this is ridiculous. I actually looked up the numbers because I was so interested in knowing this. And uh, prior to the 2017 tax cuts taking effect, there were 5 million tax returns that took in AMT. After the, that's, that uh, tax to Cuts and Jobs Act went into effect, there were only 244,000 people that get, that um, got caught up with it. I mean, this is, this is in, uh, I mean, yeah, actually, I'm talking about itemized deductions. So, I mean, this is insane. This is absolutely insane. So many people do not have to fill an itemized deduction sheet. They don't get st- stuck with AMT. This is a this is misinformation. You want to talk about misinformation? The misinformation from the 2017 Trump tax cuts is huge misinformation on the Democrat side, and they know it. The people in, the people who know it know it, and they won't correct the record. They're not not only let me add to that too, because we always have this argument about did it pay for itself, which by the way is such a ridiculous concept. A tax doesn't have to pay for itself. A tax below, the tax is not the government's money. It doesn't have to pay for itself. And that being said, it did. Revenues went down for a short amount of time on the federal level, and then started shooting up a very at an excellent angle. Now the point that I always make too is that everyone's like just looks at federal tax. Now look at state, counties, municipalities, particularly let's talk about well-run ones that actually probably deserve money around the country. They're getting more money from those taxes as well. It did a, such a great amount of good for the general financial health of people. And I love when they talk about like, oh no, we're not, for, in that perspective, we're not raising taxes, we're just letting them expire. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard too. They're not letting anything expire. As Milton Friedman said, there's nothing more permanent than a government uh, a government temporary uh, project. And th- for them to let it expire would be completely irresponsible because it absolutely did work. Yes. Okay. So on another note, I mean, this goes also to the misinformation, disinformation thing. On the other side, 
And that's the fact that they essentially lied about the jobs numbers for a year to to the tune of 818,000 jobs that they said that were created that actually weren't created. Now, uh, you know, this has happened before. They've had to readjust jobs numbers when they get better information. But this is a new level of misinformation. I don't think we've ever seen this type of uh, jobs uh, miscalculation in the history of the United States. And you have to believe that they must have done it for political reasons. Okay, so first of all, that's 1,818,000 jobs, which, by the way, gosh, I wish there was someone for the last 18 months telling them that their birth death model that was uh, estimating jobs creation was wrong and why it was wrong. Oh, yeah, there was. And it was about a, a thousand of us trying to explain that to them. But now add into the fact that every month, well, actually, to be very specific, 12 out of the last 14 months, when the jobs numbers have been posted the first Friday of every month, they, they've, they've beaten most of the time. But then the next month, 12 out of the last 14, they've been quietly revised lower, pretty much always under the beat that was advertised when they first came out. So this whole thing is nonsense too. Now, add in the the cherry on top of this whole thing is over the last 18 months, all the jobs that they are creating, the bulk of them have been government and then government proxies like education and healthcare at a tremendously disproportionate amount uh, compared to history. So this is becoming a non-productive economy even if you take them at their word of the numbers they're releasing. Now you throw into the fact that it seems to be that all the vectors are pointing to they're wrong, but they're always wrong in one direction. They always overstate it. When everything, I'm, I'm a big fan of probability distributions. And when this continually happens, you have, it is perfectly reasonable to start thinking something nefarious is going on in those numbers. It sounds like a conspiracy to me. Does indeed. And by the way, they used to call us crazy conspiracy theorists. And now all we are is just three months ahead of the curve because it's all my conspiracies have come true. Well, I mean, so but this goes to even a, a deeper uh, problem that we have, and that's that the experts aren't experts and you can't rely on them anymore. So, I mean, <laughs> what does this say about any trust in government? I, mean, I have actually no trust in government, government numbers. I have no trust in, quite frankly, I'm still pissed off about the covid hysteria for the education system failed, the healthcare system failure failed. They've not been held to account. There's been no apology from them. I mean, but, you know, you just start to not trust the experts anymore. And uh, that's a frightening position to be in. I'd like to, to add something to that too. And I agree with you hundred percent, but I don't trust the experts, particularly when incentives are misaligned. You mentioned the government experts too. I do think there are independent economists health professionals who are not who are not doing research for the pharma companies and when their incentives are aligned properly i do have a level of trust in them but the moment you get like an let's talk about the economists if as soon as an economist starts to get a paycheck from one side of the aisle then he is no longer then he is no longer unbiased and it becomes irrelevant so yes they everything they did was wrong the entire time and i start to think to myself if everything they did the entire time was wrong, like the 180 degrees wrong, what was the real intent? To think that it was a power grab for the last four years, I, don't, I think that that's a reasonable thing to debate. Of course, they'll point a finger and say we're crazy conspiracy lunatics, but we, we already are comfortable with that. Well, you've got uh, Mark Zuckerberg finally admitting to some degree that he about that? that he was censored by the government, or was told to censor, and then he's trying to waffle and say, well, we made our own independent decision, probably because he doesn't want to get sued <laughs> for the censorship. I mean, so he's he's you know very carefully choosing his words when he talks about this. But nobody doesn't doubt that the government came down hard on him and the other media companies. Yeah. And, 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 and they, they did it for power purposes, to win elections. I don't think there's any question about that. When you talk about just a story like the Hunter Biden laptop, which how quickly they came out against it saying, oh, it's, it's Russian disinformation. That's why I believed it right away. <laughs> when the people who have lied to me 10 times in a row give me another theory on the 11th time, I assume that it's lying. And guess what? It was, particularly in intelligence agencies. And by the way, when you get a call from the federal government or the FBI, or you, it, regardless of the wording of it, you are being leaned on. This was, without any question, in their words, election interference. And I think it should be dealt with relatively harshly. Oh, by the way, spoiler alert, it won't be. Uh, no, it won't be. Well, look, I, I've got an interview with Nigel Farage coming up. And uh, you know what? He's leading the charge over there in Europe. And uh, he gives me some optimism that uh, some of his outspokenness will take hold here in America. I think Americans have seen enough. So I'm, I'm looking forward to November 
and hopefully they'll make the right choice. But J- Jim, I just want to thank you so much for joining me on The Real Story with Jeannie Ives. I always appreciate your analysis and your outspokenness. And guys, uh, listen, go to Brant's. <laughs> appreciate that very much. Thank you, Jeannie.